Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's 1 million by 1 million strategy roundtable for entrepreneurs. 1M1M, as you know, is the first and only global virtual accelerator for startups. Our mission is to help a million entrepreneurs help reach a million dollars and beyond in annual revenue. Now, to this is our first roundtable of the year, first public roundtable of the year. And this is the 380th session. We've been doing these for a long, 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 long time. We started experimenting with this format of online mentoring way back in the fall of 2008. And uh, we launched 1 million by 1 million at the end of 2010. So all these activities that we are doing in support of our mission have been going on for a long time now. So it's great to have you all here on this uh, January 4th, our you know kickoff of the new 2018 year, and uh, we you know our promise is to be here every week for you and uh, work on all your businesses as much uh, for as long as possible. Um, the event is being recorded. The recordings are all available on the 1M1M Roundtable's YouTube channel. And you'll find a lot of other video content there as well. So if you are kind of just starting out and are looking for a learning tool, this is a very good one. Listening to um, these roundtable recordings is a very good one to immerse yourself and to simmer in this atmosphere and um, vocabulary of entrepreneurship. Um, now, if you are live tweeting the show today, please use hashtag 1M1M. And if you want to join us on Twitter, at 1M by 1M and at Sramana, the two handles. And we publish a lot of very rich learning content, inspirational content through these um, two handles. These are the call-in instructions. We would like all of you to participate eventually. The beginning of the program, we have, you know, pre-planned programming, but uh, it is a roundtable. It's not a broadcast, so we want to hear your perspectives. We want to definitely brainstorm on your issues and, and so forth. So do feel free to uh, call in when I open the line for call in, and in the meantime, note down what you want to ask or what you want to discuss. We're going to start the program today with Laurel Tooby, Managing Partner of Supernode Ventures. Laurel, welcome. It's great to have you here. Thank you very much. Uh, it's pronounced Laurel Toby, by the way. Toby, okay. Yeah. I'm surprised our paths haven't crossed until now. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> So tell us about your investing focus. How big is the fund? What size investments are you making? Let's get to know one another here in the uh, forum. It sounds great. Um, well, first, let me start off by saying uh, I'm a founder first. So I can tell you, I'd like to kind of frame the whole discussion since we have time with how I started out as an investor, if that's okay. Absolutely. Perfect. Anything that helps uh, us get to know you. Yes, yes. So I started out as a founder, and before that, I was in journalism as a uh, as a writer and editor. Um, I wrote for everywhere from Business Week to um, you know Crane's New York Business to Glamour magazine. And while I was working as a journalist, I started a cocktail party basically to meet guys um, because I was uh, it was before Tinder existed or anything like that. And so you had to still meet people in real life. <laughs> so I started this cocktail party, and the party evolved into a massive community of journalists, media professionals, everyone from advertising agency people to people in sales and marketing at media companies to um, journalists such as yourself. And uh, the party could have just ended like that, like it's just a nice little cocktail party. But I had something inside of me that was entrepreneurial, and I started thinking of these parties as a focus group with my customers. So I started asking people, 
What can I offer you that you would pay for? What kinds of products and services do you need? And uh, what can I provide for you outside of this cocktail party? The party was a magical place where people were finding jobs, they were finding boyfriends and girlfriends, they were making true, deep friendships. There are people who are now close friends who have remained in touch for all these years due to the cocktail party. There are babies because of our cocktail parties. So people told me, well, I could use jobs, I could use education, I could use health insurance. There were all kinds of things that journalists needed. And so I started offering those things. I created one of the first websites for media people ever in the United States or possibly in the world. It's called MediaBistro.com. Uh, it went online in 1996, and it's still around. It got sold a few times, um, and it's still out there. So the, the website uh, went up live in 1996. I grew it to um, multiple uh, millions of people using it, and uh, we had 40 employees. And then I sold it in, 19, in 2007. I can't believe it's so long ago. And uh, basically, uh, I own 64% of the company. I sold it for $23 million. And today, um, I now took some of that capital and began investing in tech. And now I'm doing my first, uh, basically my first uh, institutional fund. So that's kind of mm -hmm. a little bit of background. So what, um, what are the specifics of the Supernode Ventures Fund? How big is it? Who else is involved? What's the, what's the context? Okay, so the fund itself is a pre-seed fund. We are investing in pre-seed, so very early stage companies. Sorry, I had to move <laughs> into another room of my office. Um, uh, it's a huge snowstorm here today, so we're, you know, we're kind of dealing with it. Uh, the best we can. Um, so it's a pre-seed fund, and it deals with um, basically the very, very early stages of tech. Um, we're looking at B2B, enterprise, fintech, um, some consumer, but not a lot. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I have a partner. Her name is Jenny Friedman. She worked at mm -hmm. ENIAC Venture prior to this. And, yeah, so that's, those are the kind of the, that's the, the overview. What about geography? Are you investing in, in any particular geography? Do you have um, specifics about you have to be three miles away from your companies and stuff like that? No, I, I don't think we have a geographic um, focus. I think we're definitely most interested in East Coast because we can affect the companies that way and we can help the companies. So one of the main things about our um, about our venture firm is that we actually – help our companies. We have dinner parties and events that we do, and that's kind of something I was really good at when I was a founder, and so I brought that uh, skill set to venture. You don't see mm -hmm. a lot of venture, uh, venture uh, firms our size that are doing so many events and so many high-value uh, networking connections for their founders. They're too busy running around, but we find a way to do both. And what... Um can you double click down on what kinds of companies you like to invest in? What are you looking for? What, uh, you know, if some examples of what you've invested in and how do you analyze what you're investing in? Okay, that's like four questions, Ramana. So which one do you yes. want me to start with? <laughs> Let's start with what, what are you looking for right now? We're in the beginning of 2018. What types of companies would catch, capture your fancy, align with the investment pieces that you've created? Okay, so right now I'm looking for serial entrepreneurs, people who have already started a company successfully like me and who are starting their next company. It seems like it's an addiction for a lot of founders to start uh, multiple companies um, serially. So we're looking for serial entrepreneurs. We're looking for – it's probably easier for me to tell you what we're not uh, willing to do. We're not doing healthcare tech. We're not doing hardware. We're not doing a lot of ad tech or a lot of um, consumer. But um, we're not interested in things that take millions and millions of dollars to get to market. We want you to be able to build it. B2B SaaS, it sounds like, mostly. Pardon? 
You're mostly interested in B2B SaaS kind of stuff, yes? Yeah, I mean, we're very practical. Let's, let's, let's say this. You know, the West Coast is all about moonshots and, you know, the future of Tesla and that sort of thing. That's all great, but for, my, for our first fund, we want to be able to make a, a, you know, make a return for our investors so that we can put our second fund together. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, so I think um, we're probably going to err on the side of being a little more practical for this, uh, for this first fund and not go for those moonshots, although we love disruptive technology, stuff that's not copycat. Um, yeah, okay, yeah. got it. So, uh, second question out of the four, what have you invested in? Give us an example or two and tell us why you chose to invest in those. What were the specifics of those deals? Okay, so we are currently um, raising our fund. I'm, oh, I'm not allowed to say that. Well, we're about to close our first close of our fund. So we have, um, you know, we're just now looking at investments for that fund. But um, in my angel investing, you can see some indicators of companies that, you know, that I invested in personally that have been doing really well. Um, one of them is a company called AppBoy, which actually is marketing tech, but I did it, you know, five years ago. So, <laughs> so it, it wasn't quite as crowded as it is today. Um, and it's called AppBoy. It's, it's changed its name to Brave. B R A Z E, and it's basically software to help marketers reach out to their um, to their communities via um, via their via the app, right? So it's uh, managing your community of users through your app better. So it's analytics. It started out as just doing one or two things, and they they had a wedge strategy. We're going to get in there. We're going to do one or two things really well, and then we're going to expand from there. And that works. That's one good example. Um, some of the companies, some of the other companies that I've invested in are, I mean, if you look on our website, supernode.vc, you can see a bunch of them. Um, another one is Credit Justo. It's a small business lender um, in Mexico, actually, and it helps uh, small businesses get access to capital, um, basically by uh, securitized debt. Um, so if you have a home, uh, but you know, you're, there, are no, there are hardly any mortgages down in Mexico for small, um, you know, people with uh, small homes. So it's hard for them to crack open uh, access to capital for their businesses. So they tend to want um, to borrow against their homes. And so uh, Credit Justo allows them to do that in a quick, efficient manner. That's another okay. example. So, yeah, so there's, there's like 22 companies. I don't know if you want me to go through all of them. <laughs> no, no, no. So uh, the question that I would like to follow up um, that explanation with is uh, what trends have you seen? Let's say in the last three months you, are, you, are, you have a deal flow. What are the highlights of what you're seeing in that deal flow? Uh, there's a lot of um, – here's what I'm noticing. I'm noticing a lot of companies that are – disrupting companies that are already out there. So, you know, 10 years ago, you didn't have uh, Ticketmaster and StubHub and all these. And now, mm -hmm. not only do you have those, but now those are considered old school, old technology, legacy, right? Mm -hmm. And so what we're seeing are software companies that are the new kids on the block that want to disrupt those companies mm -hmm. that, are, that were out there just 10 years ago. So, I see the path of innovation moving quicker and quicker, right? Um, so you're not going to wait 25 years to launch another Ticketmaster. Ticketmaster will be disrupted now, right? Mm -hmm. Stop having mm -hmm. all these others. Um, and so the incumbents have to look over their shoulders or they have to act, acquire these companies that are coming, that are up and coming right. uh, faster and faster because – And modernize their technology, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's Moore's law, right? So things yeah. are moving faster, and I'm noticing that already. I'm, I'm kind of shocked that some of the companies that are coming in here and they're saying, well, we're disrupting, you know, Ticketmaster of all things. Um, and, you know, you have to really take a look at them because they might just do that, right? They might mm -hmm. do it, and you won't be part of it. 
Well, and it's a it's an interesting um, way to go to market because there is already a product out there that is you know entrenched, but there is already budget. There is already a whole organization around it. So when people want to go into something similar, there's a, you know the disruption process, the cycle of disruption is. Is a known cycle of disruption. How do you, if you have something better? It's a matter of convincing the market that you have something better. But there is already awareness about the needs, the pain point, and all of these things. You don't have to establish that pain point again. Well, not necessarily, because you know a lot of people think, all right, this is it's done, right? Ticketing is false because Ticketmaster is so big and Subhubber is so big, and you know all these companies are so large, right? So there's actually a bias to say, you know, hey, that's all. Of course, solved. there's a bias. So that's why you need a go-to-market strategy that that can effectively dislodge the whole ecosystem around it. The people who would put their tickets, sell their tickets through Ticketmaster, you have to convince them to get on your platform and so forth. But but people do understand that they have to sell tickets online, and that is one of the ways they, you know, get people to their shows and concerts and games and so forth. So. So that's understanding. When Ticketmaster started that understanding, they had to create. Yeah, and and then there's then there's disruption of um, industries that previously hadn't been disrupt, disrupted before. So there's still room out there for software and insurance tech and real mm -hmm. estate tech, yeah. and you know there there are all kinds of areas that still and ag tech. There's still um, room for new income, new people, new companies to come up and solve problems there. So that's exciting yeah. too. So we're we're just putting our fingers out there, our tentacles out there, and trying to find all kinds of um, founders who come from those industries, who understand those industries, and who are working hard to uh, to make change. How do you process the current investment climate, where capital is moving further and further upstream? How does a pre-seed investor like yourself? Mitigate the Series A gap. Uh, when you say mitigate the Series A gap, I don't quite understand what you mean. I think it's very. Let me explain exciting. what I mean. Um, so, if you look at the numbers, 2013 onwards, the number of seed investments have been huge. You know, I think the 2013 number was 70,000, and since then, it's 50 to 70,000 seeds. Investments and by seed I mean the entire spectrum from pre-seed, seed, post-seed, pre pre-series A, all of that falls in in the general umbrella of seed. Um, but the series A number or the venture financing number still remains pretty constant. It's about 1,200 to 1,500. So there is clearly a big drop off. Um, now, if you've invested in, in a pre-Series A company, you obviously have, you know, the level of risk is higher. So what is your strategy? You haven't yet done this because you're still in, about to do your first fund. But what, have you thought about it, how you're going to navigate this? Um, I mean, we have, I have done it personally. I, every company I invested in of the 20 yeah. Yeah, the 22 companies that I, you know, I created a portfolio and a track record of 22 companies. All of them are pre, all of them are very early stage. Um, some of them are pre-seed. And so um, I plan to, to take my learnings and the lessons that I learned uh, through those investments and the mistakes I made and basically do a better job on my first institutional fund. And so that's why what we're doing in our portfolio construction is we're looking at companies that have valuations of lower than five million uh, valuations. So we have to be valuation disciplined, and we're offering our limited partners access to the pro rata rights, meaning we're giving them access to invest as the winners come out of that group. Now you're going to have a lot of failures, um, mm -hmm. and of course you expect that. But there, if we if we do it right, and I think we are going to do it right, um, we'll have a, a huge number of companies that are going on to their Series A and beyond, um, and we're going to offer our co our uh, LPs access to those companies to invest in them. 
So mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure if I answered your question or if I understood your question. Well, there, there are you know, several ways of answering the question that I've heard people answer who are doing pre-seed funds or seed funds even. Um, one way to do it is pro rata participation. And it's very difficult for small funds to do pro rata participation for if you have five rounds of funding before a real series A, um, you know, you dilute the company hugely and it's very difficult for small funds to keep participating. Um, right. So, yeah. that's so, so that's where, not... where you're answering the question is that you're going to ask your limited partners to participate and that will, you know, give them some leverage there and, and that would be attractive for them. The other answer I hear a lot is the pre-seed funds um, are perfectly okay with selling out um, to later stage funding. They don't want to wait till the exit. They're okay with exiting as long as they get a good multiple, um, even at Series A or Series B, and that is another way of mitigating. Um, and actually, this, this is a good segue into the question I have about what your impression is of unicorn mania. Again, as a pre-seed investor, you could get buried under later stage liquidation preferences how do you protect yourself? And I think some of the questions that you're answering are similar, um, you know, similar strategies to uh, to, put, to protect yourselves from, you know, if you have a winner in your portfolio and it starts to really, you know, get big valuations and then those valuations come with big with terms that are not not attractive, that's where the early stage investors get really screwed, right? Oh, I agree, um, which is why it's really important that you stay close to those founders and be helpful to them so yeah. that you're given preferential treatment or at least uh, equal treatment as they, as they raise more capital and perhaps you have to ask for warrants for advising or helping or, um, you know, you just have to uh, offer up your pro rata rights to your LPs and for your first fund, you're basically – making more money for your investors um, than you are for yourselves in some ways. Um, but, you know, these are good problems to have as we invest in companies that succeed. And so we're going to make the decisions along the way that, um, that will determine, you know, where, where we go. Well, I'm also mm -hmm. not adverse to creating SPVs, you know, to invest mm -hmm. in pro rata, in the pro rata of these companies. Yep. So yeah, that's another that strategy way. that we're seeing a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So last so question, that... uh, Laurel. What um, what do you think of this particular uh, phenomenon? One of my observations is that we're in 2018, beginning of 2018. Lots of stuff have already been built. Nowadays, there aren't so many wide open opportunities with multi-billion dollar TAMs. But there are many niche opportunities, and some of these businesses need to be built for very small amounts of capital, maybe one or two million dollars, sold for 10 to 15 million dollars. Some will be even smaller, invest to 5500K and sell for five to 10 million dollars. Do you have appetite for these kinds of investments? As long as the founder is not um, trying to create a lifestyle business that they want to hold on to forever, and they're willing to give their investors an exit, then absolutely. Because that's one of the reasons that, reasons that we have to be valuation disciplined is because mm -hmm. just in yeah. case that happens, right? So if we put in um, at the 5 million or 4 or 3 million valuation, and the found, <clears throat> I encourage the founder to, you know, there's no reason why you shouldn't sell quickly for 30 million, 40 million, 50 million. I make money that way. So does the founder, yeah. actually. <clears throat> you know, when I, when I started my company, I only raised $500,000 from investors. And I sold yeah. for $23 million later. Guess who made money? I did, and my investors. I didn't raise multiple rounds of capital. So these are some of the lessons that I bring to the table when I talk to founders, is there is another way. You do not have mm -hmm. to continuously raise capital. You can also um, raise a little bit hit a certain point um, of value and sell for 10, 20x and not have to make it to $100 million in sales like so many of the other companies are trying to do. Yep. 
and how um, just to get a sense how uh, firm are you about your desire to invest only in founders who have done it before is that a written in stone or is that something that is somewhat of a guidance Look, um, we've got some great investors in our fund. One of them is Chris Daka from Lowercase. And one of the, he's also an advisor to the fund. And one of the, the great pieces of advice he gave us is to be flexible as possible and not make any hard and fast rules. So we're taking his advice. We are not uh, stuck on any hard and fast rules. Um, and we're going to be flexible as possible. So yeah, we don't, we don't just want to invest in serial entrepreneurs, but I will say this, once you've been down the road uh, a couple of sure. times, you've learned so much. It really so helps much. feed your, no your success on no your question. company. No question. And, and that's, uh, you know, our community is full of first-time entrepreneurs, and the learning curve for them is incredibly steep, which is what we are trying to help them for years and years mitigate is, you know, there is a certain – amount of stuff that you have to master if you want to navigate this game of startups reasonably and without losing your shirt and without uh, blowing up, <laughs> that, um, yeah. you know, it's not easy to do. At the same time, you know, there have been very successful first-time entrepreneurs, and we know so many of them, both yeah. so many yeah. of them who are so prominent and also so many of them we know personally. So yeah. being flexible have, um, is good. We have about 40 points of reference that we look for in terms of uh, investment criteria. Um, mm -hmm. So a lot of it's just in my head, but um, some of the signaling that's, that makes me excited is when a founder really, really knows the space that they're going after. I mean, yeah. of, course, of course, if they're an entrepreneur who's done it before, that's a huge, great signal. If they have technical uh, expertise or technical co-founders, that's excellent. If they've already done customer research and actually um, outreach to customers, because it's all about the customer, right? You can have mm -hmm. a, the best idea in the world, but if it's just your idea and you haven't really tested it and if you're fearless about testing, you know, there's a lot of people who who are afraid that their idea will be will be killed, right? So they, they're so attached to their idea that they're, they're afraid to actually test it with customers. Well, that's something you have to get over. So they have to be fearless. They have to have gone through strife before. I'm very, very, um, I'm not very excited about founders who, you know, had it easy all their lives and were handed everything, and so they've never really been through tough times. So I really like to over-index on founders who've gone through something um, horrible <laughs> in their personal or professional lives. I, I want them to be stress-tested, and I want them to be people who will never give up, right? It's not the same as being, um, uh, you know, being somebody who's bullheaded, but it's somebody who's flexible and yet will never give up. There's, the, there's, you know, there's a fine line there, if you know, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Resilience. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for uh, sharing your insights, Laurel. I know you have a lunch to go to, but you're going to stay for a little bit. So let's start the mentoring session and. Uh, Folks, those of you who are uh, pitching today, a quick, um, you know, level setting of expectations here. This is a working session, so we're going to be working on your businesses. We're going to try to figure out what, uh, you know, what can help you in putting your, you know, one foot before the other. And um, this is a safe place. We have no other agenda other than helping you. So feel free to let your hair down and uh, ask your questions, and we will do our best to help you. If you disagree with feedback you get here from me or from Laurel, just listen, and you can process the feedback later. You will have the recording of this session available. You can think about what you're hearing. It's okay to disagree, obviously. If you knew everything that you were going to hear today, then you would have no need to come here today. So most entrepreneurs, especially those who are doing this for the first time, have blind spots, have knowledge gaps, have methodology gaps, and that's okay. You're, that's why you're here. You're trying to learn. One thing keep in mind, not all businesses can raise money, not all businesses should raise money, and raising money 
does not guarantee success. So do not frame your um, mental model such that success equals financing. Success could very well equal getting to you know, millions of dollars of revenue with no external financing or very small amounts of external financing. And, and this is a, unfortunately, this is a mental model problem that we see out there in droves because the media has kind of made it out to look like success in, in entrepreneurship equals financing. So with that, let's turn it over to Don Rector from Los Gatos, California. Don, uh, please go ahead and present your idea or business. Very good. Uh, good morning. I'm Don Rector. I'm the founder of Go Quick. Next slide. Okay. The business that we're going after is the tour bus operations. These are the t buses that take people to uh, areas of interest, uh, typically vacationers, give them an, an hour or two at that location and then move on to another. From the days of the beginning of this industry when it was actually house uh, horse-drawn carriages, some problems have existed and still exist today. And that is when you get back to the coach, you sit there and wait for the stragglers to come in. Or you have guests that are just totally lost and end up getting left. Uh, when these kind of things occur, the people that are on the coach, what we have found is they get upset at the operator. And the operator would like to sell additional tours beyond the one that they're on at that time. Some guests get so upset that they stop using tour services at all and drive themselves to uh, the different locations, and then they have to worry about parking and getting there and all of that. Other, a couple of other problems that occur is emergencies can happen. Uh, example is one of my advisors did a charter tour of a high tech, took a hundred high tech company uh, people up to the wine country. And at the first stop, uh, one person didn't return. Uh, the driver actually went into the tasting room, looked for him, couldn't find him, finally left. That, fi that next Monday, the owner of the company found out why the person didn't return. They decided to go out and look at the uh, vineyard itself, had stepped in a hole and broken their ankle. Uh, and his learning of this was the person's attorney calling to let him know that they would be suing his company. Luckily, it doesn't happen often, but it does. Uh, what uh, my advisor said, well, my insurance company is going to pay for it, but I'm going to pay for it in increased insurance costs in the future. Next slide, please. What we are doing is developing an app that actually solves these problems. Uh, it, what will occur in just the normal use of this is the driver will know at that location, at that time of day, it's going to take people 10 minutes to return to the coach. At 10 minutes till he needs people back, he sends an alert out to all of the people that are on the tour. The people acknowledge the alert, and the alert, by the way, is sound, vibration, and visual. When they acknowledge the alert, up pops a map that is individual to each one of the guests that shows them where they are and gives them the route back to the coach. Because when the coach dropped them off, uh, it went and parked somewhere else. When it comes back, it's probably not going to be at the exact spot that it was when it dropped you off. There might be multiple coaches. People don't look at the coach to figure out which one is theirs. Also through surveys, we found out that most people are late getting back, not because they lost track of time, by the way, but because they're lost. They can't figure out how to get back. Next slide. Hey, by the way, all of this that I'm talking about is covered under, is made possible because of patented IP, or at least IP that we have applied for a patent, and I was notified last week that we are at what's called Section 103, uh, which is the last part of the valuation of a patent, and that, quote, it's looking very good for us. So we're expecting to actually have the patent uh, granted sometime in the next six to nine months. Next slide. 
Hey, the marketplace that we're after last year, 2016, in the United States alone, over 600 million tour bus tickets were sold. Europe is bigger than the U.S., and Asia is bigger than the U.S. and Europe combined. Uh, I can't find exact market av available market numbers, but putting all of this together, it looks like we're looking at a 2.5 to 3.0 uh, billion dollar worldwide total available market. And by the way, the market is not being served at all, with one exception that we found. There's a travel company, a tour company in Houston, Texas, that paid $45,000 to have a very poorly written app written that does kind of what we do. Next slide. Okay. The business model is a B2B sales selling to the tour operators. It is a fee for service, and I know the big thing now is to uh, have a monthly uh, subscription service, but this business is used to fee for service. It's the way their business model works, so we're layering on top of exactly the business model that they know. Uh, we believe that by the end of uh, year three, we can have an 8% share, and what's going to hold us back is the fact that this is not a forward-thinking marketplace, so it's going to take some heavy selling to uh, uh, get them in the market, uh, to get them to commit. And by 2019, we think we could have sales as high as $800 million. Next slide. Okay, these are just financial projections. They, to be very honest, they are best guess. Uh, they are with, uh, let's say, with knowledge behind them, but it is not exact figures. It, these, I do have spreadsheets to identify how we got to expenditure numbers. Next slide. Okay. Uh, our competition today is seriously harassment, coddling, and uh, the other cute one that we've seen is organized groups, a charter tour, will identify whoever is the leader of the group, get their cell phone number, and send them a text message when it's time for everybody to return and put all the responsibility on that group leader. Guess what? It doesn't work. Next slide. Okay, the go-to-market strategy is we're going to launch with uh, three to four uh, early adopters that are willing to accept a MVP that they know has some, uh, may have some bugs involved in it, and then move on. Uh, next step would be to move to other companies, tour companies in California, and once we better understand what we need to do to uh, increase or decrease the time to sell to jump into uh, across the United States and Canada. Next slide, please. Uh, the comment was made before uh, looking for a serial entrepreneur. Uh, I did my first startup was a company called Adaptech. Uh, we did it in 1979. Uh, it was a different era then. We uh, used Wilson Sonsini as a law firm. They made three phone calls, and six weeks later, we had three and a half million dollars uh, for startup funding. Now, of course, the world isn't like that. That was based purely on an idea, and it was funding the hardware. Uh, since then, I have done a number of other startups, either as a founder or as a early employee. Uh, my last early employee was a company called Revolution Analytics. I was the sales manager there, and that company was sold to Microsoft. I also participated or actually founded a company called Toner Products, and that was in the late 90s, and we were providing supplies to copiers, printers, fax machines, and I sold that to a nationwide company and made a decent amount of money on it. Uh, so that's uh, the, some of my background. There's a whole lot of others in there as well. Uh, so, Don, in the interest of time, let's go to your questions. 
Okay. okay. My um, questions? So he has questions or I'm supposed to ask questions? So, Laura, just a second. Let's see what questions Don has, and then we okay. will ask questions and make our comments. Okay. Oh, okay. Right. Is there something that you specifically want to focus on? Yeah, you hit the slide. I want to focus on getting 100 k either in the form of a convertible note or a safe instrument uh, to complete the development and give us some runway to get it out to our early adopters. Okay. So um, one question, so as, you, as I see this slide is, uh, well, it comes right after your, your own background slide. How is it that with a background like what you're showing here, you are not willing to put in 100K of your own money? Uh, because I have a wife that told me that I can't do that again. I, but can I, I ask a question? I put, Don, yes. Don, how many other startups have you self-funded um, recently in the last five Two. years? Two. Two. That, oh, okay. So that's why your wife is saying no more? That's right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So here are my here I'm gonna go through slide by slide and tell you what I think is going on here. Um I, I feel very much that you, this is like you came up with a product a problem to solve and then you came up with a clever solution for it. But I am not convinced that there is a big market for this product. It feels more like a feature that belongs in someone else's product. Um, and it's a very valuable feature, obviously. It's, it's valuable, but I don't see this as being a convincing company on its own as a standalone. So um, I, I feel like you need to do more homework uh, reaching out into the, um, into the uh, tech world and looking at what's out there that's serving the bus industry and the tour industry right now, because there's got to be other software out there right now that you could maybe um, partner up, team up with some of those folks who are already doing something very similar, already reaching that customer, but don't have your unique patented technology. Um, and I would, I would try to work with some other group first before just trying to raise capital to do a standalone product because I well, see this as a feature, not as a product. Okay. I understand what you're saying. Uh, actually, what I'm looking at is the exit would be acquisition. I, I just don't than see that there's part, a part there's during a, up front. This is a feature so Don, to me. This is not a product. Don, the, you can resolve this issue very quickly by immersing yourself in a hundred tour bus operator companies, going and talking to them, and yeah, yeah. Uh, and trying to sell this to them, and and the question that comes to my mind is, how big a deal are you striking? If you let's say you you sell to one tour tour bus operator, what is the size of the revenue per year that you think that company is good for? Are we talking uh, about a $50,000 deal, $100,000 deal, $20,000 deal, $2,000 deal? What are we talking here? Annually, uh, it will range from about a $40,000 deal on the very low end to a uh, half a million dollar deal on the bigger tour companies. Wh where are you okay. getting the, these numbers, though? I mean, if you haven't spoken uh, to American a American Bus yet. Association, which is their marketing association. But no, they have, he has the spoken to tour operators. He has three, have you uh, spoken, uh, wait, uh, have, is that true? Have you spoken to tour operators themselves? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So if you, right, uh, you know, get, my, yeah. my take would be to go talk to these tour operators and, and figure out if you can do a bunch of, you know, $40,000 to $100,000 deals. And, and that will answer your question, whether if people are willing to pay, you know, willing to take your product and, and roll it out and, and, and you make forty thousand to hundred thousand dollars per pop. You do uh, twenty uh, such deals, you can get an acquisition, I think. But obviously, it's caveat on the point whether these tour bus operators are willing to buy from you or not. So, uh, you yeah. know, all of you who are listening, this conversation we are having is your way forward in all B two B companies. Is there a customer who's willing to pay money to solve this problem that you are offering to solve for them. And that, as the minute you immerse yourself in customers and 
go through the sales cycle and you either succeed or you fail, you know whether you, you're, you have a um, viable business or not. You don't need, you know, you don't need to depend on random people to validate whether you have a business or not. You need to get customers to validate. And then if you bring that customer validation, yay or nay, if it's yay, you bring it to investors, they will be interested in investing in you. If you don't have that validation from customers, investors will not be interested in investing in you. That is pretty much how the game is played. Yeah. Um, the other thing is the design of this deck um, just is very, it's not, I mean, I know you're not putting any money in it yet, but um, it means a lot to have like a better designed deck. Um, the numbers have to be realistic. So um, on that page where you show the projections, you had $6 million in 2017. That needs to be changed to zero because 2017 is over now. So, yes. um, you know, it's very, it's very important that this stuff is, and in your Incredible. presentation, it takes, and yeah, in your presentation, it takes you too long to get through the intro. You need to um, practice delivering the presentation uh, more quickly and more succinctly. Um, and so, so the first example that you give makes this sound like a very small problem. You know, it's just like you give this very long, long example of this one customer that gets, you could shorten that to just two sentences. Um, uh, what else? And actually the yeah. numbers, the projections are too aggressive from where I sit. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to take you, these are long term cycles, it's going to take you a long time to, to get 20 yeah. customers and 100 customers and the numbers, the, the businesses don't scale like that. You, you know, these yeah. numbers of uh, yeah. 6 million, what, yeah, 6 million, 19 yeah. million, yeah. 60 million, 120 million, these are completely unrealistic numbers. Yeah, it's, that makes you seem like really unreliable. Um, 800, did you say 800 million in sales in 2019? Like, that's just not. That's Sam. That, that's not no, sales. No, no, that's no, 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 I didn't. That's Sam. Oh, okay. That's yeah. Yeah, Okay, that's Sam. Todd, we're going to need to, sorry, we're going to need to move on to Tushar. To Thank you for your presentation. Good luck. Thank you. Um, Tushar, please unmute your line and tell us what you're working on. Tushar is calling from Chandigarh, India, which is a small, not a small, not a very small town, but a mid-sized town in Punjab in North India. Yeah. Hi, Shramna. Hi, Laurel. Good morning. Uh, can you hear me? Good morning. Yes, and, we can hear you. Uh, first, first of all, wishing you a great 2018 year, year ahead. Uh, my name is Tushar, and yeah, I, I am from India, which is in the northern part of India. Uh, I am from Chandigarh, which is in the northern part of India. Uh, I'll be talking about an, an idea on which uh, we are we are researching at the moment. It's a B2B SaaS-based idea. Uh, we have named it Boost Pro. So the basic value proposition of our idea is that it's it's sort of a, um, a reputation management platform. Uh, I'm sure you would be aware of reputation management. So whatever reputation you are generating online, we are talking about a platform which can help you generate that reputation as well as uh, 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 maintain or manage that reputation. Uh, I'll, I'll be talking more about this in further slides. Next slide, next slide, please. So our hypothesis for this idea as of today is that businesses, specifically in North America, they understand the importance of social media and reputation. And they are also mature in understanding that not all social media is equal. So let's say if I'm a hotel, my social media or my target social media channel should be TripAdvisor because that's where the the return on investment comes in. If I am if I am a hotel, my my uh, social media channel has to be Yelp because that's where my customers no, are. Talking about restaurants. Sorry. You're talking about restaurants. If it's a restaurant, you said hotel, hotel TripAdvisor, restaurant Yelp. 
Yes, we got restaurant, it. Yeah, restaurants, yeah, restaurants, sorry, sorry, yep, yep. And let's say if I'm a nail, nail art saloon, so maybe for them the preferred social media channel on which to generate reviews or on which to generate engagement might be Facebook. So based on industry, we have specific social media channels. Now our, our proposition is that at the moment, the small businesses and medium-sized businesses which don't have money to spend on social media, uh, on managing social media or on generating revenues, we want to help them. And right now what's happening is that they understand that they want to generate social media uh, reputation or they want to generate positive word of mouth. But the problem is that the, the control of the channel is in the hands of the end customer. I'm prom maybe as a business, I'm prompting my user to leave me a positive social review and the business and the customer is actually leaving a review. But as a hotelier, I want that review on TripAdvisor, but that review is coming, let's say on Facebook or let's say on Google, which is not giving me that benefit. So our entire hypothesis and the value proposition is that we help the business generate a review, generate a positive word of mouth on social media channels where it matters the most. Uh, next slide, next slide, please. So this is the workflow of the application uh, which we are planning to build. So in the first step, you see that customer makes a purchase and moves out of the store. So it can be a purchase or it can be tendering of a service. Once he's out of the store, simply my store owner has to key in the customer details and an SMS will go to my customer. So he would be prompted to review the business on a on a particular social media channel. So if I'm a hotelier, I can, in in my settings, I can select that. Okay, the SMS has to lead my customer to TripAdvisor. Or if I'm a nail art saloon, the SMS has to prompt the customer to review me on Facebook. And once the customer reviews, my business owner can manage that. Uh, manage those reviews through a dashboard. So this is a very basic workflow, but the core workflow of the application we are planning to build. Next slide, please. These are the markets which we are we are planning to target. Uh, it's largely the North American market and tentative segments which we are looking right now are uh, the ones mentioned here, restaurants, automotive, lawyers, maid services, snow removals. And from the business perspective, definitely it's solopreneurs and small and medium businesses which are which don't understand social media so much and which don't have basically the resources to dedicatedly uh, spend on social media. Okay, next slide, please. Now, this is an interesting slide. Uh, let me let me tell you that we haven't started building the building our application. We are still in the research phase. As a part of our research, what we realized is that there are around 15 to 20 companies, maybe more, who are already in this segment of reputation management. Now, this is where the things get interesting. Most of these companies, I would say almost 90% of these companies cater to the high ticket size businesses like automotives, law firms. Their pricing is upwards of $300 per month, tying into annual contracts, which run almost $3,600 per annum. And their sales mm -hmm. model is very high touch. So if you leave, if you ask them about their pricing, first of all, they don't have pricing on their websites. The, the sales rep reach out to you, gives you an hour of consulting, tries to sell you hard, then a week of, let's say, negotiations and setting up your accounts, and it's, it's a high-touch sales model. So what our proposition is that what if we target this industry segment in a do-it-yourself model, and mm -hmm. we target those industry segments which are not touched by these businesses. For example, restaurants. The ticket size in a restaurant, maybe it's almost it's 20 to $25, while in an automotive uh, company, it would be somewhere around $10,000 to $15,000, right? So what if mm -hmm. we don't start from the biggies, but we start taking the smaller segments in a do-it-yourself model and at the fraction of the price which, these, which the incumbents are offering. So for example, my SaaS is, let's say, selling at 50 to 100 USD per month, vis a -vis the competitor who is selling at upwards of 300 per month. So that is the mm -hmm. basic assumption with which we are carrying out this research. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is largely how we are planning. Uh, this is the go-to market strategy, what we are planning. So just like any SaaS business, so we are planning to f offer free product demos 
trying to we'll be trying to find a sales partner a local sales partner and doing some content based marketing but that's for the later part when when we actually roll out but at this moment from now i have few questions for you which are there on the next slide and which i would like to have your view and as well as laurel's view on so first of all given the segment that it's already an existing market do, which is which is not doing it in the do it yourself model based on your experience do you think that this business is feasible in do it yourself model uh, second question is if it's feasible then why are not incumbents doing it it's just because uh, i mean just because it it's happening like this they everyone has been targeting the big companies and they have been earning in thousands rather than hundreds and that's why everyone is, is doing like that or there is well, something which i am missing here can I say something? Uh, you shall I go? continue my questions? I let okay. me complete the questions so, and then we can take it one on. One second. Let Laurel uh, answer your first question. Let's just, do, let's just do one at a time, for God's sake. Um, so here's what's going on. Um, you're talking about the long tail, and you're talking about it in a very difficult market to tackle, which is small, medium-sized businesses that are, you know, restaurants and things like that. It's 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 tremendously hard to get them mm -hmm. to get their attention to find them, and also they're not very technically oriented. A lot of them are just struggling to get by. Most restaurants fail after two years. Um, so I have a, so I, I really feel strongly that this is, um, this is a very, very difficult market to tackle. And the reason that the incumbents have gone up market is because they realize it's too expensive to, um, for customer acquisition costs to get to those smaller targets. And so it just doesn't make financial sense. Mm -hmm. So um, the only way that you're going to be able to do this successfully would be to partner with another firm that's already going into these places and selling something to them, right? So, and I would start, why mm -hmm. aren't you starting in India or somewhere? Do they not have reputation issues? Why are you starting in the U.S. market? Uh, that's one thing I had, I wanted to ask you. And secondly, have you I talked to any potential... Have you talked to any potential customers at all? So we have talked to two, three customers, not many. As I said, we are in the research phase and we are still reaching out to customers. So uh, to, be, to be true, we haven't talked to too much, but yes, only two, three people. And uh, the response is, I would say it's a mixed response. Uh, frankly, I can't conclude anything by talking to those two, three people. So that's why I happen to come to this round table to understand your perspective. So are, um, let me give you my thoughts. Um, the main reason that people avoid this very small business market is that customer acquisition costs are very, very high. Um, and, and it's just expensive mm -hmm. to, so the, the, the amount you make in terms of revenue per customer and the customer acquisition mm -hmm. cost make it unviable unit economics wise. Now, having said that, um, since you are uh, based in India, I, I imagine you have seen a bunch of the Indian case studies evolve, which have done very well in that market. For example, Zoho is one that uh, has done very well catering to the very small business market. One of our portfolio companies, Freshdesk, mm -hmm. um, has done very well and has become a major you know, success story in the Indian market of catering to that market. So, so, so if, you are, if you have an Indian cost structure, and if you can figure out how to mm -hmm. sell online, acquire customers online profitably, and be able to service mm -hmm. these customers online profitably, it is not impossible to, to cater to this market and, and build significant businesses in this market. The issue that you have to figure out is, is there a go-to-market strategy? Is there a customer acquisition strategy that is viable mm -hmm. in the, within the constraints of your unit economics? So go figure out our, um, right. you know, our restaurants yeah. are these very small businesses. This is not even small business. We're talking about very small businesses. Are they looking for mm -hmm. reputation management or review and rating mm -hmm. management uh, technologies and, and at what price points? What, what is the volume of Google search on it, etc.? So, so I, you know, I think right. Laurel has is more negative in terms of the concept. I just. I know that in the Indian context, there are, have been co companies that, be, that have been able to 
get in here, but your conclusion that two or three customer feedbacks is just not conclusive is absolutely correct. You need to talk to 100, 200 customers, not two or three customers. And, and the question she asked about why not India, why the U.S., is one that you're going to need to also think about. Is this something that you should be starting in India, or does it make more sense mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. start in the U.S.? Again, a lot mm -hmm. of the, the research that you need mm -hmm. to do is to understand what is the search volume on this, because if people are not looking right. for something like this, then outbound mm -hmm. selling is going to be, and customer acquisition is going to be really, really expensive. Right. Okay? Right. Does that yep. answer your question? Yep. Got it. Yeah, okay, it does. Great. Thank it does. you. Okay, we're going to go to Murali Tirupati from Bangalore, India. Murali, please unmute your line and tell us what you're doing. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Hi, uh, I'm Murli and I'm the co founder and CEO of uh, Voltage. Uh, I have 15 years of enterprise software consulting and sales experience. And my co-founder is Sajiv. He has also has 15 plus years of uh, experience building enterprise products from scratch. Also has several patents in uh, big data and analytics space. Uh, we, are a, <clears throat> we are a legal technology company, and uh, we help uh, law firms and legal cross outsourcing firms complete their contract review and abstraction projects four times faster using AI. That's the okay. core of what we do. And yeah, next slide. So uh, the core uh, pain point that we are addressing is this. If you take uh, legal cross outsourcing firms, I'm talking about firms like uh, uh, United Legs, QuizLex, or even BPO firms that do this work, like uh, Accenture, Wipro, uh, Infosys, all these companies. They take anywhere from uh, four hours to two, uh, two days to abstract a contract. Right, for contract mm -hmm. administration purpose. So it impacts cycle time margins as well as the ability to scale. And if you look at another segment, which is law firms, a law firm that does the transaction due diligence, they take uh, about four hours to review a contract as part of the due diligence process. So again, it impacts cycle time, and uh, this kind of work, again, is a fixed price uh, work for law firms. So there again, there is an impact in terms of profit as well as uh, in terms of their ability to scale. So what mm -hmm. we have done is uh, we created an AI platform that can understand contracts the way a lawyer does and can automatically extract relevant information from these legal contracts all in just 60 seconds. And then mm -hmm. we present this uh, extracted information alongside the contract in a very uh, easy to use UI so that you can review the extracted output, make necessary changes before you take it into the downstream process. Uh, through this process, we say about 75% uh, of the time it normally takes to review and abstract legal contracts. <clears throat> um, uh, right now, the way we are selling, it's a, it's a direct selling is what we are doing. Uh, through the network that we have here in India, uh, in the enterprise software space, essentially enterprises, we are identifying the prospects. So in BPOs and LPOs, the prospects, our target audience is uh, the head of contract management or uh, data management services practice. We reach out to them sometimes through contact, sometimes directly or LinkedIn. We do a demo followed by a free trial and then push them towards a paid, uh, you know, paid engagement. And we are also uh, getting into partnerships and integrations. We have tied up with uh, Aptus, which is a uh, leading you know, world's uh, top uh, contract lifecycle management software company, and also working on similar engagements with uh, other uh, CLM vendors. And we are also aligning with service providers, essentially who do this legal cross outsourcing, uh, legal contract management work for their customers going through them to reach out to their customers. So this is this has been primarily what we are doing in terms of selling right now, and just about thinking and a little bit of experimenting with inside sales, you know, calling a lot of customers and then seeing if, if that is actually, you know, helping. Uh, from a validation point of view, we have, uh, we have two customers at this point. One of them is... Uh, uh, the, one of the top five IT ITS companies, global uh, in the top three. Uh, 
And uh, here we do lease abstraction for their clients. They, they do lease abstraction for about 50 enterprise customers. They have a volume of about uh, 15,000 leases in a month, just lease contracts, forgetting about mm-hmm. all the other types of contracts. So we are starting in one of their accounts and uh, getting a revenue of $3,000 per month. And uh, we also have sold this to a mid-sized law firm in India who are using it for due diligence. We also have multiple pilots going on uh, with both on, with firms both on a BPO side as well as law firm. Okay. So it seems uh, like on, where you're getting sure. <clears throat> action is in the BPO, LPO space where people are already – the, the, there are intermediaries who are already doing this in an outsourced mode, and you are making their operation more efficient, yes? Yes, absolutely. So while we looked at both these segments, BPO, LPO as one segment and law firms as a second segment, we are getting more traction in the BPO, LPO space. Of course, of course. How big is that segment? What is the How many BPO, LPOs that do contract uh, management for uh, customers? Sure. So pretty much every BPO and LPO firm does this contract management service. So you call it contract management or data management uh, service. We looked at, when we looked at this segment and looked at the top 100 firms in this space. Mm -hmm. Uh, So uh, if I look at uh, the top 25 BPOs and LPOs, each of them has more than a billion dollar in revenue. And the next mm-hmm. year of uh, 75 companies have anywhere from 100 million to a billion dollar revenue. Uh, okay. So that is the that is the market that we are looking at right now. So it sounds like you can comfortably get to a million dollar um, annual revenue run rate just catering to that segment. Yes, absolutely, absolutely, we can do that. Uh, at the same time. Uh, it would start small in any of these accounts. For example, this company that we are working with, uh, the potential is huge, but we are starting in one of their accounts, one of the 45 accounts that they have at, at $3,000 per month revenue. So, and, and I think that that's how it will start in many of these engagements, and over a period of time, we'll be able to expand to more and more uh, you know, accounts within that company. So I think the first thing you need to do is to work with the BPOs and LPOs and, and get close up that segment, basically. Felt into that segment and get all the top clients in that segment on your platform. And, and you know, some of those clients, uh, some of those, uh, con- you know, uh, sales cycles are going to start with small um, monthly revenue run rates, and then it's going to expand as you prove yourself, the POCs. But you should do paid POCs. Don't do unpaid POCs, but I think the value proposition is very clear. You know how to sell to them, and and I think that's where, you know, once you get to this 1 million annual revenue run rate point with a SaaS company, everything becomes a lot easier. And and I think based on what you've described here, I'm very encouraged to believe that you are going to be able to get to a million dollars with that segment, and that that is your market penetration system uh, segment clearly. Now, the question of whether you're fundable or not really depends on what is the TAM, what what are the other segments, how big are the other segments, and so on and so forth, where and how, what is the velocity of those segments? Because VCs are looking to go from zero to $100 million in revenue in five to seven years. Can you deliver that? I think I'm convinced that you can deliver a, you know, a couple of million dollar uh, annual revenue run rate company based on your first segment, maybe even more. Maybe you can even deliver a $5 million annual revenue run rate company based on your first segment. But that is not sufficient for VCs. That is perfectly fine for a successful bootstrap business. Are there? What are the d- dynamics of the other segments? That's what we would need to work on to figure out whether you're fundable or not. And we'll be happy to help you with that. Okay. Okay. So a couple of points over there. One from a market uh, a market size. Uh, what we estimate is it's about. Uh, uh, Three to four hundred million dollars in that segment, in the BPO LPO segment, this this particular area. Now, uh, uh, yes, you know we are working through in terms of you know 
convincing more more customers and getting into more engagements. Now, one of the challenges that, that we face in this uh, segment is uh, they all, you know, have some internal tools, right? So they do this in bulk. So they, of course, invested time in trying to build something, but uh, uh, but none of them are really successful in terms of building it in house. That's why you know they are looking at us as, as well as right there because are a they of AI capabilities are few and are not easy to find, and these law for, uh, BPO LPO funds firms will not have AI capabilities. So I think. Uh, I think you do have an unfair advantage there, and I, I'm absolutely convinced that you will be able to come up with better tools. They are looking for tools to automate. So this is this is a completely viable business. Um, I think the question is, how big can that business be? Uh, it's probably hmm. not – I mean, I, I don't – it may be even $5 million in revenue, and, and my recommendation to you is right now to focus on – capturing that revenue and really building your product to a successful point and then Got going it. from there. Um, and and, and yeah, then so the rest we can figure out how to, uh, okay. you know, how to access the rest of the strategy to see whether you have a venture fundable business or not. But you do have a business. It's a business that can be, you know, successful and profitable and so forth. So that's good. Congratulations on that. Thank you. Uh, so, so, uh, so uh, broadly, our you know, from a roadmap point of view, what we are uh, trying to do is, you know, the the technology that we are building, while we are applying today in terms of contract abstraction, the way we are building it is how can we apply this, or rather, the technology that we have can be applied for the complete contract lifecycle, right from contract ordering, right, so whole contract ordering, uh, playbooks for contract negotiation and uh, contract administration, that whole thing. So that is that is how we are looking, and that is where so I Burley, see a much, much bigger market. So Burley, if I were you with yeah. this company, I would build it up, that segment, to a significant revenue level and get the product fully fleshed out, get your ro product okay. roadmap fully fleshed out, and then sell the company without taking venture financing. And I can help you with all of that. I know the CEO of Aptos very well, and, uh, you know, there is a bunch of – you know, contract management activity going on here, and one of those companies would probably be happy to acquire you at a reasonable price. Great. Sounds good. All right. Good we'll, luck. We'll be in touch. Thanks. Thank you. Syriac Joseph, you are up next. Hey. Hi, uh, Shamana. Uh, this is Syriac here. Hello. Um, mm -hmm. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Can you, you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you just fine. Go ahead. All right. Um, so um, I want to quickly take you through uh, Swatantra, which is uh, perhaps the world's first zero med self-care solution for chronic pain uh, delivered through a mobile app. Uh, so next slide, please. Yeah, so this is our team. Uh, that's me. Um, uh, I passed out uh, from SMSLE sometime in 1994. I also happen to be an accredited Thai massage teacher uh, and um, have uh, currently also do a lot of digital advertising, SEO, analytics, et cetera. Um, we also have Pradeep who handles our tech stack and Dr. Madhura who uh, validates um, our app from a medical point of view. Next slide. So um, an overview of the market, uh, about 1.5 billion people suffer from chronic pain. Uh, this is globally. Uh, about 27 of those, 27 percent of those cases involve back pain. The average cost in terms of productivity, medication, etc., is about $2,000 per year, just in the U.S. Um, nine out of 10 people don't really know the primary cause of their pain. And in a survey, six out of 10 people said they were willing to pay dollar one per week in taxes, not just just in in curing themselves, but just dollar one taxes for pain research. So uh, there's a big market out there, uh, uh, but there are not many solutions. So there is surgery, but it's expensive and dangerous. Uh, then there is medication like opioids, uh, which are basically pain suppressants. And, you know, in the U.S. right now, there's a big opioid epidemic right now, so people don't want to use it. Uh, and then uh, the next level is basically massage, uh, which four in ten people have found to be uh, effective, uh, chiropractic care. Uh, also works, but the problem is that these people are not easily available. You need to make an appointment, and they're expensive. Next slide, please. 
And so that's where uh, we, uh, there is a modality called trigger point therapy, which is basically a drug-free solution for chronic pain. It's an anatomical framework that's used uh, world over by body workers, physiotherapists, uh, even orthopedicians. Uh, it's a well-researched graphical framework of referred pain patterns, which relate to specific inflamed muscles in the body. It was developed in 1960s by Dr. Janet Travel, and it's used world over. Uh, and uh, it's taught to massage therapists in a 2,000-page book, which is a two-volume book. And you can understand that it's not easily usable by an average uh, layperson. Next slide, please. And uh, that's where, in 2000, there was another book that was published, which kind of um, disrupted Janet Travel's model to kind of democratize it and make it available to people. Um, this is a screenshot from the reviews of that book, uh, which is called Trigger Point Relief, A Self-Treatment Guide to Pain Relief. Um, this book is in, has been incredibly effective and very popular. Uh, as you can see, uh, it's got 873 reviews, uh, most of them five star. Uh, and so that's kind of where we've taken uh, trigger point therapy and put it into an app. So next slide. And so this is, um, this is the real live uh, working model of our prototype. What it allows you to do is allows you to mark the pain points. So those blue areas are where the person is experiencing pain. It can be done in three dimensions. You can zoom in, zoom out, rotate, and mark it. And then the app will ask you a set of questions. And essentially, it will then tell you the three or six top reasons, uh, top muscles from where your pain is coming from. It will show you its location. And then we'll show you videos on how to locate it, massage it with a ball or a stick or something, and then stretch it. So that's a basic model. Uh, as far as go to market and you know our real early segment, early adopters are we're looking at 30 to 60 year old working professionals on a desk job. They all suffer from pain. Uh, and uh, the typical profile is a runner, a fitness enthusiast, high performance athlete. They're prone to injuries and they want to get back to running, cycling, whatever they want to do because they're antsy and they can't sit down at home. So they need to uh, get themselves fixed and therefore they're willing to experiment and take a more proactive route uh, to pain resolution than those you know, who are happy to sit down and then just go to a doctor. Next slide. And uh, the second segment we're looking at is basically professionals uh, like massage therapists and body workers. Typically, a massage therapist would take uh, between 50 to 30 minutes in a session just analyzing uh, to find out where that root cause or which muscle is uh, or muscle chain is causing the problem. And so um, that's one of the big markets that we look at eventually, which is um, body workers who would be interested in understanding and using the analytics in Swatantra. Uh, and yeah, so uh, basically a go-to market is Facebook ads. Uh, I personally have a lot of experience with it, so uh, maybe a dollar, two dollars per trial, uh, search engine optimization, uh, virality, we are building that into the app, so uh, I could uh, analyze the pain of my mother. So it's a, a subscription model. So the, the the app itself for pro users is about, at this time, estimated about $20 a year uh, versus the plus, which is for the amateurs, is about $4 a year. And there's also a free trial uh, for it. Now, uh, so quickly, uh, one is, depending on how much money you put in, uh, this project could be bigger uh, or uh, smaller. Uh, so um, one question is, is this project at this point of time fundable? Uh, if yes, what would be a good ask? Who should we ask? And if not, what would make it fundable? Do you have an app already and that is that people yeah. are buying? Uh, the app, the app is revenue? not yet. The app is not yet on Google Store or uh, Apple Store. It will be in maybe uh, two or three months. We are, we are so completed this is not a stage where team. apps are usually funded these days. You know, mm -hmm. the app store mm -hmm. is crowded, unless an app has shown that it can break out and and right. be successful, people are not funding apps. So, so right. you would have to bootstrap it to a certain level of success and show that it can be a high-velocity company, it can go from mm -hmm. zero to 100 million in five to seven years from the point of funding, and you have to do quite a bit of work before that to get there. Right. Right, right. So, 
Yeah, uh, I kind of anticipated that. Um, what would what would a potential uh, funder look at in terms of um, validation? Is it only subscriptions or? Um, yeah. If subscription yeah. is your primary business model, they would look for subscription, they would look for unit economics. I don't particularly like the unit economics that you presented here of, you know, 1.8 to $2 per uh, customer acquisition, and then just sell $4 is what you get mm -hmm. from them. That's that's not a great per year. unit economics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, uh, I mean, that is something that is uh, to be uh, experiment with. So if that is your unit, yeah. I would prefer I would prefer that you go to the pro then you hire acquire customers for two and and sell them twenty dollars. That's much right. better, um, right. especially if there's a multi-year value proposition. Let's say the customer mm -hmm. lifetime value is a hundred dollars. That's a much better unit economics. The consumer model is not the economics is not good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sounds right. Sounds right. So I yeah, would, that's, uh, you know, my guidance much. would be focus on the pro and see if you can actually sell to pros and and you know cost effectively and mm -hmm. you know and generate revenues and show validation and then we can worry about funding. Right now it is not right. fundable. Right now you have right. to build the business to a large extent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that feedback. Yeah. You're very welcome. All right, folks. Uh, we're going to take a few minutes to explain to you how to use one million by one million. Before we do that. Uh, we have a request for you. If you like what we are doing here, please refer serious entrepreneurs to 1M by 1M. And uh, the word serious is in bold, which means that people need to be willing to put in the heavy lifting required and the time and energy and so forth to get to, you know, serious levels of validation. It's many years of intense work to build a good business, and that's just the way the market operates. This startups is not for sissies is, you know, they're saying. So um, you have to be aware of what you're getting into. In terms of resources, 1M by 1M.com is where all the resources are. You'll find a free blog, which is chock full of learning material. You'll learn a lot just by following the blog. The Entrepreneur Journeys book series is a series of 12 to 16 case studies in each volume that deals with a particular topic. So you could find a book on cloud computing, that's Carnival in the Cloud. There's one on e-commerce, from e-commerce to Web 3.0. Bootstrapping with a paycheck is a common way to bootstrap startups to a certain level of validation before other options open, out, open up for you. Bootstrapping using services. Feminine feminism is about women entrepreneurs, etc. So you'll find tons of learning through the book series. They're all available on Amazon. These roundtables happen pretty much every Thursday. Um, they are free. This is a 380, 380th roundtable. So, you know, over 60,000 people have attended these roundtables. It's a, you know, massively um, tested forum. Um, our full acceleration program is 1M by 1M Premium, and there you get extensive methodology guidance. You get a full curriculum that is taught in video lectures and case studies. You get help with business development. You get help with this kind of mentoring, whatever you call it, strategy consulting, coaching, mentoring. That's based on your project. And then we also help you with financing, and um, that's if your project gets to a point where it is financing, and we'll help you evaluate that, diagnose that, get to that point if your business has the characteristic, and then introduce you to investors. In one afternoon, you could get introduced to 35, 40 investors, but you have to get to the point where you have the goods with which you can be introduced. And this is a $1,000 annual membership fee program. We have an, an uh, one and one and self-assessment that you should go through. Take your idea or take your business through the self-assessment and uh, see, you know, what you are getting, what, what, what kind of strategy emerges out of these questions. If you run into methodology gaps, just go to 1M1M Basic. That's a curriculum, only $99 a month program. You can plug all your methodology gaps through that program, and that would also be fine for you to kick off, kickstart your learning process. So dig around on the website. There's tons of content, tons of information about the program, what to expect from premium, basic, 
FAQs, video FAQs, etc. Um, lots of details about the curriculum. Um, the curriculum, as I said, is case studies and video lectures. We have over over 800 um, case studies, and there are that includes 50 plus unicorn case studies, probably about 400. Um, 50 venture-funded case studies, another 300 or so bootstrap case studies, bootstrap success stories, case studies. So it's an intense amount of learning where you get to stand on the shoulder of other entrepreneurs who have done it before. And there are also an enormous number of investors around this program who are also, as you saw, Laurel is offering insights into how she invests, what she's looking for. There are numerous on investors who are doing that on a continuous basis. So you get feedback from everybody in the community. We do believe in lean, capital-efficient, bootstrap startups. Even if you raise money, it has to be bootstrap first, raise money later. And um, we do help you with media. That's where if you go to the coverage, you'll see media coverage for, the, for our entrepreneurs. So all three upcoming Thursdays in January, we have roundtables. Please feel free to go to the website and sign up to pitch or attend. We also have four more in-person rendezvous in Menlo Park uh, at Cafe Boroni. These are usually 5 p.m. Pacific time, January 10th, 17th, 24th, and 31st. We had one last night. Um, that's it. We are ready for Q&A. So if you have questions, please go to the public chat and ask questions or call in. Let us know in public chat that you're calling in and we'll be happy to, you know, take questions from the phone call. And while you're doing that, let me introduce you to Irina Patterson, who is your contact for questions about the 1M1M one &one program. Her email is irina at 1mby1m.com. That's it. So the person whose testimonial is on your screen right now, Abhishek Rumta, that was in our program earlier on, and uh, he stopped by recently to tell me that his company has hit the $10 million in revenue milestone without any external financing. So as you can imagine, it thrills me to hear reports of this kind of success. All right, questions, folks? Anybody? No questions. Introductions? If you're in the room and if you'd like to introduce yourself, please do so. Tell us what you're working on, what you are looking for help with. Well, if no one has questions, then we will either see you on Wednesday, next Wednesday evening at the rendezvous or Thursday morning at the next online roundtable session. So uh, please register for whichever one of those um, or any of the subsequent ones that you would like to be coming to, and uh, we will continue the conversation. Remember, these are working sessions. So we come here to work. We come here to enhance your knowledge and your uh, mastery of the, the methodology of entrepreneurship and how to put one foot before the other, and we'll continue to host these working sessions. Uh, throughout the year. See you soon, everybody. Thank you for coming today, and Happy New Year.